kena pärast lõunat. Kõigil meie vaatajatel, muudes ülikoolides ja interneti avarustes on hea meil tervitada teid IT Kollegist osalt meie tavalistest, avalikest seminaridest ja loengutest ning täna on meil võimalus kohtuda siin Euroopa Komissioni infoühiskonna ja meedia direktoraadi esindajatega, kes on juba täna hommikupoolikul kohtunud kõigepealt meie erinevate ettevõitjatega ning teemaks on kindlasti tulevased programmid ja plaanid just Infoüskuna direktoraadis 2014 ja veel kaugemale vaadates. Our presentations will be held as well as our discussion today in English. The Information Society and Media Directorate from European Commission is represented by distinguished guests in our IT College public lecture and seminar today and without further ado I would like to give a microphone and the floor to Antti Peltomägi, Deputy Director of uh, DG Information Society and Media of European Commission. Please the floor is yours. Thank you. Does it work? Yes, I guess. Uh, good afternoon everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in Tallinn today and uh, even if it's a bit grey afternoon but it's Friday I think that we can all enjoy that it's only a couple of hours time that we are all having nice weekend. But I think before that, I think that we came here uh, for really a uh, second time. This is so-called going local, uh, where we are coming to every member state uh, to discuss with the government representatives and, and all Grenfell stakeholders. And I think that we really mean kind of all those who are interested about uh, making European uh, Union and I think that all the Europeans uh, digital, I think that are very welcome to be our partners and our uh, colleagues. And I think that's uh, kind of a really the whole purpose of, of this exercise to reach out and I think to have open discussion and dialogue with you and, and uh, find ways that, that what we can learn from Tallinn and I think take along with us back to Brussels and of course I think that uh, then the process is continuing. That we can promise that we are coming again in one year's time and I think that we prepared for the next edition of, of this show. But all in all I think that first perhaps uh, to explain that uh, DC Information Society and Media is the Director General uh, under the Vice President of Nelly Cruz of, uh, and I think that the Digital Agenda for Europe is her mandate, but I think that we try to cover mainly the ICT part of research innovation, plus then the regulation concerning the telecoms and uh, audiovisual media policies, and of course then wide range of the policy issues around these issues, uh, and, uh, but still I will only perhaps on my side try to put the presentations to come in the context because I think they are covering wide range of different kind of issues that was identified with our uh, Estonian <coughs> friends and colleagues that, that might be interest to you. Perhaps this is only to show that uh, what kind of words, uh, if you are reading the, our communication that was adopted uh, May 2010 and it's called uh, Digital Agenda for Europe. And it's part of uh, kind of a Europe uh, 2020 strategy, which was, uh, I think, that the, this commission, Barossa II, having almost like a governmental program. It's the idea of uh, what this commission is supposed to do, this uh, mandate that it's having from 2010-2015, really, I think, for generating growth and jobs in Europe. And I think this 2020 strategy was then having uh, seven flagship initiatives and this agenda for Europe is one of those. There's innovation union, there's industrial policy and etc. Uh, but I think they were supposed really to make kind of a key components of uh, this uh, growth and jobs. And then there was also some other type of uh, horizontal act activities like uh, internal market act where I think that the we try to really look at what's happening in the uh, internal market and uh, of course 
they are per perhaps overlapping each other, but, but still it's uh, our intention really to make sure that uh, what is in commission powers and whatever we are proposing, try to focus on smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. And uh, then we ended up with uh, not less than 101 actions. You might ask, is it too much? Is it too few? But all in all, I think that we tried to identify the issues that where we see that uh, certain kind of a European level action is very much needed together with the member states and, and perhaps uh, even widely with the other uh, type of the stakeholders. I don't go through them. I think that a couple of those issues like interoperability and standards to a certain extent is covered today. Trust and security is a bit covered today. I think fast, ultra-fast internet access is covered today. Uh, I think the vibrant digital single market is definitely one kind of a common denominator of the issues to be discussed today. Here is a kind of overall objective of digital agenda. And perhaps I think that uh, whenever you read it, if you don't understand, it's better to look at the pictures. I think that I could live without any text. This tells me the whole essence of uh, what is the digital agenda all about. It's trying to cover the kind of a supply and demand side of a uh, digital uh, market or digital society, where I think that you are having that kind of uh, infrastructure investments. And I think that's the upper part of, of this uh, cycle. Uh, um, sorry, it's uh, now a bit... I think the networks is roll out of the networks is on the left side of, of the picture. But of course, I think that then it's very much question that if we are now expecting that uh, market operators, telecom operators and the others, investors, are starting really to roll out fiber networks or 4G mobile networks or whatever, really making the pipes big and fast, then it's a question of what is the content that is filling those, and what are the kind of uh, services on that kind of content side that uh, you as an end user, having your mobile phone or a smartphone or, or a laptop, are ready to pay certain kind of a premium that for the service that you are getting out of this, that would then make sense for those who are putting their money and then thinking of getting the revenues back. And we believe that Whenever we tackle both the demand and then the supply side of uh, this uh, cycle, we start to see that it's rolling faster and faster and perhaps expanding, starting to generate growth and prosperity and happiness all over the Europe. But then, of course, I think that we have identified certain kind of obstacles. There are in the middle of uh, those kind of uh, elements that are breaking this cycle and I think that they are unfortunately rather kind of a tough nuts to grasp. But still, I think that there are very many elements that uh, we have to address. And I think today, my colleagues who are speaking after me are more going into the detail what type of the solutions we are having in mind, how to make this kind of a wheel of fortune or washing machine or, or as we call it, uh, uh, virtual cycle really start to uh, make. But there is clear economic evidence that uh, investments in ICT and especially in investments in uh, broadband and investments in internet are, I think historically speaking, been one of the most successful and, and I think that uh, investments that are paying back. And I think that they are really providing in terms of the GDP growth, growth of productivity, creating new jobs, and I think whenever we are living this kind of economic uh, <coughs> kind of turbulence all too long, I think it has lasted now kind of a, all different kind of economic uncertainties that are taking most of the political attention of our leaders whenever they are gathering together. And I think now whenever this morning meeting uh, the colleagues from the Estonian government, of course, they are preparing themselves now for the December European Council. And once again, it's mainly focusing on the issues that how to find the solutions of immediate crisis situation. How to stabilize the European economy, 
Eurozone. But I think that we believe strongly that this is uh, then, even if we cannot wait that uh, everything is settled uh, in the short term, but we should really start to look mid-term, long-term type of the growth strategies. And of course, that's where the Commission is uh, very much uh, identifying growth agenda, digital single market, and all kind of issues that are now very much, I think, that involved in this picture. And perhaps that's why I'm not going to use your time more on this kind of a general context type of the issues, because I think that the, my colleagues are prepared to tell much more in detail on, on some of the issues uh, under this picture. And I think that, that then we can come back uh, these kind of a more general issues. But of course, as I said, that uh, if there are any immediate questions or comments, I'm happy to hear them and then answer if I can, or then I ask my colleagues to cover those issues. But please, thank you. Thank you, Antti. Uh, any questions from the audience so far? If not, then, well, please, please be ready and prepare yours. Uh, I would love to start by stating the fact once again that former head of the Information Society issues, Vivian Reding, as well as Nelly Cruz, the present head, they are both known as a stealth ladies. They deliver what they have promised. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have also a uh, kind of uh, dynamic duo as uh, superheroes of the European Commission, ladies. In the same time, what we have seen also is uh, a number of challenges. Among the 20, 101 identified areas of intervention needed, uh, there are many which seem to be like a huge struggle. Can you identify what is uh, top on your agenda right now in terms of the priorities out of those 101 and what will be reflected back so far to you from the member states because Estonia is not the first, neither the last country you have been visiting. What is a reflection back to Information Society unit? What are the expectations from the countries to deal with in the first phase? What are the biggest priorities in member states? I think that uh, perhaps uh, I have, uh, do I have, yes, I think that uh, <coughs> we have been discussing uh, these issues uh, ever since that uh, commission adopted uh, this uh, flagship initiative and I think that we have had very positive feedback from the member states and I guess that uh, Estonia has belonged to those uh, countries, uh, I would almost like to say the friends of the digital single market that have been all the time pushing kind of a, this kind of agenda point on uh, the highest political level, on the level of the heads of state and government in the European uh, uh, Union. And I think that uh, it was the October European Council that requested Commission to define the roadmap for uh, completing the digital single market by year 2015. So that it's putting us very much pressure. But I think we are very thankful and, and welcoming that kind of a pressure on us because I think that we share the view that, that I think that even if some of those actions that we are now thinking of being them, uh, I think that the broadband investments, where I think of course that should be mainly market-driven approach that the telecom operators should uh, roll out fiber networks and then I think 4G and then 4 plus, 4G plus type of the new uh, uh, highways for our, let's say, internet traffic and uh, all kind of services being then public or private. But I think that uh, then those issues that uh, are kind of uh, breaking this kind of uh, virtual circle, I think that they're covering very wide range of issues, being them copyright issues. Are copyright issues fit for the digital age? Are we really having that kind of a public policies that we can more or less uh, help the private sectors to start really, I think, roll out those kind of investments. Are we able really then to uh, identify where I think that this is a kind of a cross-border uh, layer for the services, whether there is a kind of a private money or public money or is it the European level or national level or local level. And I think that's where I think we think that uh, it's not any kind of a one silver bullet that, that is needed. It's a question of a kind of a coherent approach of uh, very many issues and fields that is now needed, that we are having the overall impact on, on the, let's say, on ground. 
that it's not only market, but I think it's very much question that uh, it's a, also the kind of a social innovation and social impact. Uh, it's a question of uh, how modern and I think efficient and innovative our societies are. And I think that uh, high speed uh, internet broadband is very much that kind of a platform that I think is generating that kind of a new type of uh, social uh, contacts as well as, as the business models and uh, I think that the easier access not only at the side of the Europe but also at the side of the globe. Among the topics out of those 101, there are clearly, as you also mentioned, some areas which are politically prioritized more in, say, already advanced penetration and advanced uh, digital production or high-tech industries. We have recognized that uh, the declaration for the digital single market has been co-signed mostly by the Nordic Baltic prime ministers and governments while the broadband rollout issues are much more important for the southern European countries. Do you see a clusterization of the Europe within the priority areas of information society development? Or are we moving with an equally same path? Do we have a different roadmaps for the same goal or are we equally layered to achieve the goals? I think we are having the slogan, uh, I think, uh, unity in diversity. And, and of course, that's something that uh, is a kind of a challenging task. Whenever we discuss about the euro area, and I think that uh, what type of the economic structure is in Greece compared to what is in Sweden or Germany compared to, for example, Italy, I think it's kind of a different kind of a realities. And of course, I think that now comes the question that, of course, when we are having single currency, and I think that we failed a bit there to really agree that what is the economic policy coordination, and I think that then comes a bit of the question that uh, how different kind of, uh, let's say, monetary policy lines that have served different parts of uh, the euro area. It's same in every kind of sector, like I think you were referring, that where we are having kind of an industrial base uh, in Europe, it's very much north or north of uh, Germany, basically the powerhouse is Germany, and I think that then perhaps Sweden, Finland, partly I think that Estonia, very much I think that even more so nowadays, compared to kind of a more perhaps service type of the societies uh, down south, and I think where I think that perhaps is not, the economically structures are rather different, the same policies might have totally different kind of impact on, on those. But of course, I think that all in all, we believe that uh, we have to identify that kind of a policy agenda that is serving uh, as well north as south. Uh, but of course, uh, we can be sure that, that it's not one size fits all type of the solutions. You have to have certain variations and adjustments for, for a different type of the, you have to be a bit flexible whenever you are thinking of uh, what you are trying to uh, identify as a European. Do you feel at the moment secure that the European Commission has enough enhanced tools really to motivate the front runners, the fast movers, or are the countries which come to you with um, proposals about becoming a kind of fast mover of a certain area, are they problematic customers? <laughs> no, I think that we are very happy to receive Estonia, for example, in the field of uh, uh, e-services or, or I think uh, e-government type of issues because I think that uh, you have been I think that recognized as one of the kind of a real example of uh, how far you can reach and I think that of course that's where I think that we can learn a lot and I think that it, it, this is some kind of a best practice that can be used also I think that very many other parts of, of Europe. I think that of course you are welcome to be demanding I think that we are happy to have that kind of a demand so from all directions, so that, that then we feel as comfortable that we are starting to navigate. Let's say, not s somewhere in the middle, but I think that to try, try to put the level of ambitions right, that it's, I think, that's uh, really fit for the most of the uh, players, and I think that really achieving some kind of overall goals, and I think not preventing those uh, forefronters uh, really to even go a bit speedier ahead than, than they, they have been doing so far. Any questions? Raise your hands. 
Well, I would give my last one then to Antti and then give a floor to his colleagues. Uh, how can we help you? What, what is it, what, what, for example, Estonia, what our universities, what our industry can give to make you to succeed in your digital agenda? I think, as I said, that uh, <coughs> you have been recognized, uh, I think, that, uh, like uh, public, electronic public services uh, and been one of uh, really that kind of a fast mover and then really reaching that kind of a level where I think that we, many of us can uh, learn and of course really share your experiences and uh, like today we had uh, discussions with the ministries. I think that there are very many fields, uh, there are very fresh uh, and I think that uh, good experiences that, that you can offer for us. But I say that, that of course I think that uh, whenever we are 27, I think that we try to of course, identify what we have to take to the European Union level. It's uh, something that, of course, lets all the flowers blossom as uh, small as beautiful. It's not up to us, to the Commission, to start to interfere the kind of a business unless we really start to identify together with you and, and the others that, that something has to be agreed on the European Union level that serves the purpose for all of us. But I think that uh, we have been, I think, that, uh, very satisfied of our discussions with the government representatives and I think that uh, feel free to speak up, complain, criticize, suggest, make any initiatives now or later. I guess that uh, some of us might even have a kind of a, uh, addresses where we might, no, I think that my presentation was not anymore having this kind of a contact information, but I think that we are having online consultations on all these issues that uh, I think over the weekend, if you don't have anything better to do, please sign in and uh, start to contribute. Well, we should make it as a part of our mandatory classes. <laughs> yeah. Complaining and submitting ideas to European Commission as a part of our uh, seminars and exercises. Definitely. I yes. see one question in the audience. Um, so you mentioned the north-south gap between... I will give you also one microphone. Yeah. So the online group has... You mentioned the north-south gap. Now, you're, of course, uh, as a member of the Commission, obliged to promote approaches at 27, but is there a point at which, uh, and I don't know how much you were, you fam you were familiarized with, uh, with our government's um, EU policy for the next four years. One of the main points is that anything that we can't do at 27, we're willing to look at doing in smaller regional formats and potentially looking at enhanced cooperations. Uh, is there a point at which your recommendation to the countries on the northern side of this gap is to leave 27 aside and go with a smaller grouping, either using a formal EU mechanism or even within something like the Baltic Sea region. And maybe this is a question for the end once everyone else has spoken to, so I'll leave that to your judgment. I think that, uh, of course, if we are taking formally, we are having the three the provisions that uh, are clearly defining how you can end up or of, uh, on so-called enhanced uh, cooperation of the smaller number of uh, member states than the 27. Uh, okay, I was, uh, in my previous past, I was uh, negotiating those treaties uh, on behalf of the Finnish government and I know that, that what kind of, a, kind of requirements there are, they are not that easy to trigger. Uh, but okay, now it's tested in, in, in uh, the, the European patent and of course I think that's uh, perhaps the one of the test cases where it is now very much tested that whether that is a viable solution uh, really to use that kind of a formal way of, of but informally and of course I did, that we have recognized that there are certain kind of an quite natural uh, geographical uh, or regional uh, kind of a subgroups or sub-regions that could easily uh, I think that, uh, provide certain kind of a new impetus for the whole of, of the European Union and I think that we are only welcoming all kind of things. Of course I think that whenever then something ganging up might lead to sort of kind of great sort of close clubs. I think that then perhaps we start to be concerned about uh, whether it's still uh, in conformity of, of the union uh, treaties and then regulation. But uh, otherwise, I think that uh, if you find that uh, you can achieve better together with your Latvian, Lithuanian, Swedish, Finnish colleagues, feel free to go on.
Great to hear Open Clubs welcome. Uh, Antti, thank you so much, and I would like to give the floor over to your colleague Jürgen now. We will have today together uh, four presentations uh, from European Commission, and after each presentation there will be a um, time also for questions and answers. Okay, maybe just as this is loading up, I can perhaps just mention that um, the digital agenda that Antti was talking about uh, will be reviewed next year. It's called a midterm review. And we give us a chance to look at how many of those 101 have been finished, what we need to do next. So that's, that's something which we'll have for next year. Well, my name is Jürgen Gren. I'm a member of the team which drafted and has started to negotiate the Connecting Europe facility. And I'm going to talk to you about today about the telecommunications part or the ICT or digital infrastructure part of that. Um, in a nutshell, what are we talking about? We're talking about a big proposal for infrastructure financing. A big proposal for infrastructure financing in three areas. In transport, in energy, and in ICT infrastructure, so broadband or digital services. Now, the total budget of this is 50 billion. Inside uh, these three different uh, parts, 9.2 billion is for telecommunications, uh, roughly 9 million are for energy uh, corridors, and roughly 30 then, which are left, are for transport. And this is about completing the different transport corridors, for instance, from north, south, and doing various stages on that corridor to, to actually uh, build it up and make sure that it, it has a fluidity in the system. What are we talking about here if we go to the uh, telecommunications or the ICT part? We're talking about... Sorry. Could you... Yep. Uh, Higher up, perhaps. Yes, fine. Is that better? Um, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about broadband networks for around 7 billion euros, broadband access for around 7 billion euros, 2.2 uh, billion euros for digital service infrastructure. And when we talk about digital service infrastructures, you know some of them quite well here because you are, I would say, champions of Europe, if not the world, actually, in different parts of these digital services. We're talking about EID. This is the one I'm thinking about where you are very much ahead of the rest of Europe and perhaps also the rest of the world. I'm talking about e-health services, so telemonitoring, making sure that elderly people can stay in their homes and being monitored uh, via the internet, for instance. Talking about open data, making sure that the data is coming out to the market so they can use it. We're talking about safer internet, making sure that um, Internet is safe for children, multilingual services. And now we talk also about e-government type of services, uh, so e-procurement services, all of these different services. Now, what is the problem today with these services? They exist, you may say. What is the problem? You have one in Estonia, that's fine. But the problem is this, that there is no interoperability between these services across the Union. There is no ownership of a European Union, shall we say, infrastructure uh, basic platform so that these services can work across the Union. And this is the problem that we try to achieve, this is the problem we try to address, rather, uh, with the Connecting Europe facility. In terms of instruments, we will use what is called a market-based uh, uh, manner, a market-based instrument, financial instruments, or we will use grants. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you know the difference between these two market-based uh, instruments, financial instruments, is about loans, is about credit guarantees, is about these kind of different financial instruments that you can do when you finance large infrastructure projects. The grants are just normal subsidies which are given out uh, on a competitive basis. And I insist on this because um, in Estonia, you're quite, you know quite well the structural funds. And you know that for Estonia, there's an envelope 
for structural funds and you can decide afterwards in uh, connection with the Commission how you want to spend this money is 4.1 billion euros for this period 2007-2014 uh, for uh, 13 for Estonia. Now this one is slightly different. There is no envelope proposed for any country. So it's a competitive type of instrument. Competitive type of instrument. The best projects will be financed. A bit like the research uh, type of approach. We had this mix of instruments because we wanted to have an optimal leverage effect of the money we put in. We have calculated the leverage effect of six to seven times of the money that we put in. So one euro invested from Europe will in the end imply or mean six or seven euros uh, infrastructure investment, total investment. So if we multiply this or if we apply this to the seven billion we're talking about in broadband for instance, we get a figure at around 45 billion euros in the end as total investments. And these 45 billion euros, they will actually serve to, uh, to connect around the same amount of uh, households, so 45 million households, which in turn means that we, with this uh, Connecting Europe facility, with the leverage effect that we have, may be able to reach up to 100 million uh, European citizens. And why do we do this? Well, the objectives here, of course, is to, we are more and more mobile. You are probably and, and will be the most mobile generation uh, ever. Um, you will want to use these digital infrastructures when you go abroad. You will want to use your Estonian e-idea when you are in Portugal, for instance. You will want to use it when you go to Italy. Today, this is not possible. This is something that we want to, to, to try to uh, address. Um, also, lower transaction costs for the SMEs. Promote digital single market, as, as Ante uh, uh, explained and of course stimulate cross-border services. Everything that we try to do is from a cross-border, more or less anyway, cross-border type of approach. So why do we want to invest in broadband networks? Well, we feel that the current level of investment is not sufficient to ensure the growth that we need. Antti was speaking about the, the crisis that we're in. Well, we need to find ways in which we can ensure future growth. For us, Broadband is a part of it. The level of investment needed uh, for broadband is at 270 billion euros. 270 billion euros. And the market players have identified amongst themselves that they can invest up until 2020 around 50 billion euros. These are very uh, estimation, large estimations, of course, but uh, still. It shows you what the financial gap is. It's around 200 billion euros up until 2020 in Europe today. So, of course, this Connecting Europe facility will not cover the whole problem, but it's a, it's a very good start and it will stimulate investment in turn. So, why broadband? Well, current level of investments are not sufficient to ensure growth. We need more broadband. We also have a, an issue with, with incumbents, so the, the large operators. Today, alternative investors have a difficulty getting into the market. The Connecting Europe facility may provide uh, risk capital to make it financially interesting for them to actually go into this broadband market and make prices uh, uh, go down uh, or service level go up, depending on the case. And also, of course, as you know here in Estonia as well, is that there is no business case for development of broadband in rural areas. Uh, you have 10 households, you have maybe 50 households, it's difficult for the operators to find some kind of economy or business case for actually connecting these households. And this is also where the CEF uh, could come in. When it comes to the digital services, as I mentioned, you don't have an ownership of these digital services. There's no nation, there's no point for Estonia or no incentive rather for in, in Estonia to finance an EID system in, in uh, Portugal or in Spain, even if a lot of Estonians go there. The only relevant level for these type of platforms, for these type of services, is the European level. And also, many of the services that we talked about, they stop at the national border, they don't go beyond. Even if perhaps you have a good co cooperation between Sweden, Finland, uh, Estonia and, and some other of your neighbours, <coughs> it doesn't go beyond that. The only way to go beyond that is to take it up to the European level. So why do we need so much speed? Um, why do we need so much speed? Well, 
it's difficult today to say, of course, which the applications of the future will become, but one thing we do know about the applications of the future is that they will require more speed. They will require more bandwidth. And here, one of some of the applications, which would be the killer applications, as it were, depending on the country, of course, but in my home country, Sweden, for instance, the killer application is, is uh, uh, high-definition TV. This is what the operators think will actually stimulate uh, the demand for, for higher speeds in the future. But then we can also look at more public type of services, uh, more, more, more social benefit type of services, which are very important and which become less expensive. Um, and we could say money, such as uh, e-health, for instance, such as uh, education, such as uh, uh, remote diagnostics and telemonitoring that I was just mentioning. So these, these are very uh, much, uh, they, they need a lot of bandwidth, they need a lot of speed, uh, and this will not get better, this will more probably get worse. And when we come up to multi-application usage, of course, then we get up to 100 megabits already today. Also, um, we are in a competitive situation in Europe today. We're not the only ones on this planet, as you know. Our competitors, what are they doing? It's always a good way to look at what yourself you should be doing, or at least think about, is to see what your competitors are doing. And the competitors are investing heavily in broadband. They think it's a growth-inducing, growth-enabling technology. They're investing in broadband. Uh, and they will be continuing to do so in China, South Korea, uh, and uh, Russia, and the United States. And, and we're with Russia at the lower end of this, uh, in 2014, if you see. We're at the lower end of this. Now, in next generation access, so very, very high speed broadband, we have around 1% coverage in EU27 today. Japan and Korea, they have around 15 to 16% household coverage of this next generation access. So we're quite far behind. Uh, the CEF connecting your facility will at least help to, uh, to put focus on this gap. The digital agenda targets, um, you will asking about which ones which are important. You see all of them are, are important, of course, but you see around this, this, this table here which ones that, that could be perhaps seen as uh, some of the main objectives that we have, like uh, citizens buying online, roaming at national prices. And if you look at 50% at of households have subscriptions of 100 megabits, which is at the very top. Um, at the very top, does this not work like this? Oops. Oops. Ah, sorry about that. Ah. There you go. So at the very top you see 50% households have subscription uh, rates of 100 megabits per second. That's the goal we have, that's the objective we have for 2020. You see that we are basically nowhere. Uh, the objective we have for 30 megabits is 100% uh, by 2020. You see that we are roughly at 30% today. Um, and you can, you can check on all the others. With broadband coverage, broadband is coverage in this sense is very slow speed. Very slow speed. We're almost covering the whole of Europe with the old generation of broadband. But with the next generation of broadband, as you can see from this map, we're basically nowhere. But we can discuss, the, I can put this up again if you want to discuss this afterwards. Now, if we do invest in broadband, if we do invest in broadband, what could be the impacts? What could be the impacts? Well, you have impacts all over the place, really. Uh, most of them positive. You have direct job creation uh, if you invest in broadband heavily. And we're talking now about the full investment of 270 billion. Job creation. Added value, 152 billion euros added value to EU economy. 2.7 million man-year jobs. Indirect job creation. Entrepreneurship will be accelerated, particularly in ICT, but also more generally. Um, a 10% increase in, in broadband, now on the right-hand side, a uh, 10% increase in broadband household penetration will give a GDP growth of 1 to 1.5%. Uh, smart grid services for energy uh, will give you uh, very strong savings. These are U.S. studies. Um, even if we go for savings for government in, in, in these different e-services, if you look at 
e-government type of websites or web services, e-services like e-cadastre in Spain, you have a savings of 150 million per year. If you go for an EU-wide e-procurement scheme, which you don't have today, you can have savings for public uh, authorities up to 50 billion euros. Energy using, office buildings, uh, telemonitoring, you can save quite a lot from that instead of taking people into homes instead of taking elderly people into hospital, they can stay at home and mostly be happier, but still have some kind of a monitoring, uh, making sure that nothing uh, untoward happens uh, against them. Education is a great growth creator as well. Broadband will enable all of this. Um, teleworking, apparently if you work from home, you're less sick than if you go to the office. I don't know, I'm not so sure about that personally. I prefer to go to the office than to sit at home all day long and waiting for auntie's mail and saying, do this, do that, for instance, up until midnight or something like that. I prefer to go to the office and go and see him. But, you know, this is very personal. Here uh, in the U.S., they've, they've actually calculated that this, uh, the people who work from home um, are less sick than the people who go to the office. But, okay, fair enough. One important thing is that 10% broadband penetration, further broadband penetration has a very strong effect on labor productivity growth, 1.5%. This doesn't sound much, but economists in the commission tells us that this is huge. Um, but what if we don't have CEF? What will happen? Well, the world will not go under, obviously, but there are some impacts that will not come. Certain part of the impacts I'll just show you will not be there. There will be other type of impacts. We will only be able to work with regulatory measures, that we call it. So, in other words, we work on the rules rather than on the uh, uh, um, investments. We work on the rules, making sure, perhaps, that, that the operators can no longer use the copper network that they have, so the old network that they have, making sure that they can't charge too high for that type of network so that they are forced by this to invest. That's sort of the stick uh, approach. Um, we think that this should also be complemented by the carrot approach, of course. Huh? The investment gap that we talked about, the 200 billion, and the leverage effect of 45 mil billion that I talked about will not be there. There's also a cost, but this is more global than just, just uh, the CEF, obviously. This is, this is of not completing the digital single market that Antti was uh, uh, presenting to you. I mean, there's, there's a cost there in terms of GDP growth. So the GDP growth in 2020 will be roughly 4% lower than otherwise would have been the case. And here I give some anecdotal, shall we say, evidence on, on the, the kind of savings that you can, you can do. So if you're in, in a UK offline household, for instance, and you can't buy or pay your, your, your bills online, you will miss out on 600 euros, roughly, of savings per year. It can be quite a lot for a single family. That's 60 euros roughly per month, and that could be interesting in savings. So this is the kind of slogan we try to, to put forward. You make no mistake about this. Huh? This is about a proposal from the Commission to try to stimulate and future-proof the EU economy. It will not do everything on its own, of course, but at least we try to stimulate it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jorgen. Immediate questions, reactions? Do you feel that the present funds available uh, are sufficient to stimulate the missing gap? What else could be done and what should be done? Because we don't see at the moment, uh, despite the fact that telecommunication companies are doing pretty fine compared to the rest of the economy in many countries, they don't see at the moment too much internal capital availabilities, yeah. neither the borrowing market uh, supporting them in, in rolling out uh, yeah. the broadband. Is what else could be done? Well, I mean, CEF, CEF of course, could, could be a part of the, of the solution to help them to make the business case or to make the financing of this very long-term type of infrastructure. That's the problem. Right? It's a very long-term infrastructure. Uh, it pays itself back <coughs> over 20, 30 years, you know, or 10 in best-case scenario, but still it's kind of long-term. Uh, and this financial instrument, a part of this would be financial instrument, we will help to lower that prices, lower that prices, and incite more, perhaps, institutional investors to come in. Because, uh, you know, pension funds, they are still looking for long-term investment possibilities, and they should be 
interested in, in, in broadband. And also, of course, we can't just say that Ceph will fix everything or the 7 billion will fix everything. Of course not. It's not the, the, the way. But you have to see it as, as a complementary approach where regulation in the future and this investment uh, possibilities in the future will go hand in hand and try to incite the telecos to, uh, to, to invest more in next generation access. There have been a number of policy analyses which have been also attempting to recommend uh, the kind of central government or pan-European regulation which enforces telecommunication operators not to build up parallel uh, competing infrastructures but to invest jointly into infrastructure when the competition should take place on top of the joint infrastructure based on the services available. And your own home country, Sweden, was one of the examples where the 3G investments uh, were made jointly, yeah. surprisingly without government enforcement, but by yeah. an market rationale. Have you seen any other opportunities like that or encouragements around the Europe where private industry is making the investments jointly? Mm. Not uh, that comes to mind. Maybe my colleagues will have a, have a couple of uh, examples in mind. But uh, uh, I, I know about the Swedish one, uh, and uh, we actually talked to to the uh, to the uh, authority uh, about this. Uh, and they, it was, a, as I understood it anyway, it was a, a, an executive decision to stay away. So it's not just laissez-faire. Huh? It was an, a decision not to, 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 to uh, break into the market at that level, at that moment. Huh? I, don't, I mean, one of, of the very good examples that we've seen uh, is Estwind. And it's one which is done here in es Estonia. And this is an extremely good example for us because, I mean, I, I'm sure you know it much better than we do, but it's a kind of a foundation uh, that, that cooperates uh, in putting uh, down the, the, the fiber and then they compete on the last mile, basically. Precisely. Yeah. And this is, we think, is a quite good, a very good even, uh, best case scenario for how you can do it and in particular <coughs> to reach the rural areas and to reach the rural communities or where broadband is not generally available. So, so I mean, Estonia is actually one of the of the examples that we usually use for this type of, of putting it together and then competing on the relevant parts, put it that way. You mentioned also about identifying the joint European digital service areas. One of them you brought out as the EID, which is it's, there is kind of no rationale of, for each country to build up its own or not even to build up uh, the EID joint system within a cluster or region of, uh, or sub-region of European Union, uh, any other similar type of uh, cross-European <coughs> initiatives you would like to highlight? As, as I, I think I mentioned a few of them. I mean, we have uh, uh, e-procurement, for instance. We have the uh, Europeana, which is on cultural goods. It's quite important. I mean, this may sound like something nice to have, but you know, it's, it's, it's extremely important that we actually do have this joint and you do have it accessible. Maybe I should add that the reason for these digital services is not just to connect the e-government services between themselves, but it's also to create a platform for new industries. Because in this CEF proposal, we say that we will finance the platforms and the generic services, as it's called, but we will not finance the applications. So the applications is for the commercial uh, enterprises to compete upon, and, and we're pretty sure that once we've given this platform, using perhaps the EID ideas from Estonia as a, as a basis, the applications will come. We are pretty convinced of that, but the platform needs to be there. The platform needs to be there. I can give you another example of where it's important to connect uh, European service and services is e-justice, for instance. Uh, I can give you another example. So e-justice, I just give that there are 10 million cross-border legal cases every year in Europe, and one million uh, migrants in, inside Europe. So I mean, there's a lot of, lot of uh, issues that can be solved quicker and better if these systems are connected to each other. A last example I can give is business registers. 
So just to be very concrete, for instance, today it can take quite some time for, a, say, a German company to look for information about a Portuguese company. They have to send, you know, a letter, maybe they go through trade associations and things like this and to, to, to request uh, information. In a business register system, which is across Europe, they would put the request to the central server in German, which would send the request back down to the Portuguese uh, company or the association which gives out the information in Portuguese, send it back up again in Portuguese, and then the German company would get the answer back in German. This is a very concrete way of showing how important these, these actual connections and digital services are. Indeed, we would even say that if we don't have these digital services, the digital single market that, that, that you were talking about will, uh, will be difficult to achieve or to complete at least. Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. I'm uh, working as an attorney myself, and actually this uh, uh, e-registers and commercial registers uh, is really pain in hell uh, for us for work <laughs> <laughs> to cross border issues, yeah. and also yeah, e-justice as well the same. But actually to continue uh, from your presentation, I wanted to ask that okay, if one side is this infrastructure investments, we can say that basically we need to build the pipes to have the necessary platform ready for the companies to start initiating maybe new, new services, but the uh, other side, what I feel, I'm uh, working uh, mostly on the copyright issues, yeah. and this is the territoriality and uh, segmentation of the EU market. We have 27 different uh, member states with different uh, regimes, yeah. and I think here why we are lagging behind of, uh, for example, our competitors, yes, you, you mentioned South uh, Korea or China or Japan or US, they have a um, yeah, unitized market in this sense. I mean, the content is uh, regulated in the same way. So this is my, my question to you, that this infrastructure is one thing, but another thing is really this kind of um, uh, regulation for the content or regulation for the services. So this yeah. is uh, one, another issue. Thank you. Of course, I mean, we, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. We, we, <coughs> we always face it, but I will leave it to my colleague to come after to, to, to touch on, on copyright issues and IPRs um, more specifically, but just to give you that fragmentation is, is, is the issue that we are combating as much as we can. And uh, just to give you an example, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it seems kind of obvious. You know, you have a business register in, in China, it serves one billion people. You have a business register in the States, it serves 350 million people. We have 27 business registers in, in Europe, it serves 500 million people. So, I mean, you can see just by this, this quick example, you see that it, it's not necessarily reasonable and it's definitely not reasonable that they don't speak to each other. That is definitely not reasonable and this is what we're trying to, uh, to uh, address. Thank you so much, Jürgen. And uh, without further ado, and to also to accommodate the question we had already from the audience, I would like to give a floor to Philip Rung, who covers from the DG Info Society also the audiovisual and media policies. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction um, and for the question. I, I would like to, to start the, uh, the presentation maybe with a, with a question. Uh, whom of you has already used uh, iTunes uh, in Estonia? So we have uh, five, six, seven people. That's, that's quite a lot uh, given the, uh, the, the amount of, uh, of, of people here. Um, I, I, I used to, to, to ask this question uh, quite often in, in, in presentations and, and usually people tell, uh, tell me that um, uh, they wanted to, to uh, try using it depending uh, where they are, but they couldn't because they were, uh, for example, uh, rejected uh, due to their credit card details because they were, uh, re their credit cards were registered in the, 
uh, wrong country. And this is uh, um, practically already the, the, the issue I, I wanted to, to talk about today. Um, We, we have demand for content in the uh, European Union and we have demand for digital content. And there are different uh, indicators for that. We have uh, an indicators from the ICT industry. I have here uh, an example from the German IC, uh, IT association Bitkom, which um, uh, shows a uh, huge uh, increase of, of demand for paid downloads in, in uh, in, in Germany, <coughs> paid downloads uh, reaching from, from music to games to uh, videos, audiobooks, uh, whatever uh, you, you, can, uh, you can download. Um, there are other indicators uh, such as uh, the, the sale of mobile phones, uh, especially smartphones. Um, more and more people want to, to use their, their smartphones, not just for uh, telephony, but they want to use it uh, for consuming content, uh, when they take the um, uh, bus to the to the work, or when they um, uh, do sports, they they, uh, they they want to listen to music, or they want to to read uh, um, press articles, uh, or watch um, uh, television news. So um, it's it's fair to say that um, there is demand uh, for digital content. And we also have uh, legitimate offers in the uh, different member states. But the main problem is that uh, most of these offers are not cross-border. Most of these offers uh, are just uh, directed to a, a national market. And uh, this wouldn't be uh, such a big problem if uh, some of the uh, markets within the European Union wouldn't be cut off uh, of, of this uh, development. But uh, this is um, um, the, the case today. And there are different um, reasons for this uh, cut off of markets <coughs> or for the fragmentation uh, in the European Union. And I have listed here a few reasons. First, you have te technological barriers. We spoke about infrastructure and the different uh, situation of uh, broadband rollout within the European Union. In some member states, uh, you have a very good situation. In other member states, um, there's much to do to improve the situation. Uh, then we uh, already touched upon copyright. There's uh, uh, certainly an issue with uh, copyright licensing. Um, speaking of music uh, especially, because here we have a uh, um, system of collective licensing, which has grown as, uh, as a national system. Um, and um, it is fair to question whether this, this system is up uh, to the requirements and to the challenges and to the demands of a, a digital single market. Then, um, going back from, from music to, to audiovisual content, we have statutory uh, and contractual provisions relating to release windows. Now, what are release win windows? Windows are um, uh, exploitation patterns. Uh, that, that means that um, usually uh, a movie, uh, when it is produced, is first shown on cinema, then on TV, then it is released on DVD, and so forth. And uh, finally, at the end, uh, there comes the online exploitation. Now, this is, of course, due to the fact that um, uh, the production of audiovisual content is highly costly and that the production of European content is uh, in practically all cases dependent on uh, public aid. Uh, in in contra uh, contrast to the US, you don't have um, European movies which are produced uh, only by, uh, by uh, private investors. You always have a considerable part of the uh, production budget which comes from the from state aid. And then there's an, another reason um, uh, which leads to fragmentation um, uh, and this is pre-financing. When uh, a European film producer wants to uh, make a movie, he has to collect money 
and he has to collect that money before he can even start to, to shoot the, the film. What he will do is that uh, uh, he will pre-sell his rights to different distributors in, in, in the different uh, member states of the European Union to collect uh, a maximum of money. And this, of course, is then the result uh, for fragmentation. Because when uh, the film is, is uh, ready, uh, the distribution rights will not be in one hand. Uh, the distribution rights will be split into uh, uh, will be split in, into different territories. And this makes, of course, then uh, a cross-border exploitation extremely difficult. There are other reasons, uh, apart from copyright or um, film financing, um, for this fragmentation, <coughs> especially um, lack of legal certainty for service providers. Uh, this has, of course, nothing to do with, um, with copyright. It's, it's rather... Um, consumer law, um, consu uh, service providers and consumers have to, uh, to trust each other, um, otherwise you, you won't uh, start, uh, you won't launch uh, uh, a flourishing digital content uh, service market within the EU. And finally, uh, last but not least, you have cultural and linguistic uh, differences. S uh, content services are not uh, services as as any other services, they are, they are the expression of uh, a culture, the expression of a, a linguistic tradition. And that's why um, um, often it is said uh, content services will never flow as freely within the European Union um, as, uh, let's say, financial services. Now, whether this is true or not um, is, uh, I would say, at, at this stage, not even the question. At this stage, it would be, it would be good if uh, the demand that exists is already served, whether this uh, leads then to, to, um, to a full uh, digital single market uh, for content is another question, but definitely there's uh, lots to improve. And we see um, different uh, technological and uh, uh, business uh, trends in the US but also in the European Union. We see cloud computing, we see um, uh, the increasing use of social networks. Um, Facebook is, I think, one of the sites uh, which is mostly used uh, or which uh, takes uh, most of the uh, daily consumption of uh, average internet users uh, throughout Europe, um, especially young internet users. We have connected TVs where um, traditional media distribution meets the internet. So you have on, on one screen um, the, the traditional broadcast uh, and the interactive um, online application. And all these technological trends, of course, uh, raise regulatory questions. Um, concerning connected TVs, uh, one, one question would be, what are the uh, rules for um, uh, protection of minors? What are the rules for advertising for when, when we have these two different services on one screen? Because at the moment we have uh, different rules uh, for, for, for both uh, services. Another question would be, um, what about territorial exploitation? Because you mentioned that um, when consumers are more and more used to uh, cloud computing, when they uh, access, when they upload their content once or they buy their content once and then want to access, access uh, this content from different places and on different devices, um, what does it mean for the, for the territorial exp uh, exploitation of uh, films and of music? <coughs> now the European Commission has, uh, with the digital agenda, uh, set up a list of different initiatives which try to address exactly these questions. Uh, the first initiative I, I want to, to present here is the Directive on Orphan Works. This is something which is especially important for um, museums, for archives, um, but also for public broadcasters who have in, in their archives uh, a big amount of, of works 
which uh, uh, where the, the right owners are not necessarily identifiable anymore. So um, a public service broadcaster, for example, will be in a situation that he wants to put uh, old uh, broadcasts online, but he can't because he doesn't know who is the relevant right owner, um, who he should ask in order to put the movie online. So the directive, uh, the proposal for the directive has been adopted uh, uh, in May of this year and it's currently debated in, in European Parliament. Um, the uh, lead committee in the Parliament will um, vote most likely on it on the 20th of December and we, we can expect um, um, an early agreement of this, uh, on this proposal between the Parliament and, and the Council beginning of 2012. But there's no guarantee, of course, for that, but uh, uh, it's fair, fair to assume. The second initiative I wanted to, to present is the so-called Green Paper on online distribution of audiovisual content. A Green Paper is a discussion paper. So th this is not a legislative initiative. This, this is the, the stage before that. And in, in this uh, discussion paper, in this Green Paper, the Commission has um, identified trends and had, has raised questions um, and has started a, a public consultation which ended uh, last week and so far we have collected uh, about 100, 160 contributions from organizations, from associations, uh, from NGOs, companies, but also from citizens and we are analyzing them. And, uh, um, we'll see what, what, what are their answers, what are their concerns concerning um, audiovisual distribution but also audiovisual production. How do they think um, should in Europe audiovisual production and audiovisual distribution work uh, on, the back, uh, on the background of the trends that I just mentioned. And finally, um, the framework instrument on collective management. Now this is um, um, a very important uh, directive, especially for music. Music is uh, mostly uh, de dependent on collective licensing. And uh, the Commission will um, adopt the uh, proposal most likely in the first quarter of 2012. Now the um, underlying issues of, uh, of this framework instruments uh, are are many, uh, but uh, one, le let, let me say, you, you, you can sum them up in, in the following way. On the one hand, you want to, to uh, facilitate licensing. So you want to, uh, to have a, s a very simple procedure so what, that when a commercial pr uh, user, let's say a mobile operator, wants to, to get a license, he knows where to go and then he gets exactly what he wants, he can pay and uh, all these transactions work very efficiently. So simplification is, is one objective. And then on the other hand, um, you want also to achieve uh, more competition. Why? Because competition uh, leads to efficiency, uh, competition leads to, to more transparency, and competition can also lead to lower prices. And uh, so these Objectives, these two objectives are um, to be brought into balance and this will certainly be one of the, of the, the biggest challenges of uh, uh, the Commission uh, for the proposal and then later for the Parliament and for, for the Council when they will discuss this proposal. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to, to say that uh, we don't look at this, at this on, only from the user's perspective, but we of course have to, to watch also the, 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 the interests uh, of the right owners, of the, of the authors of, mu of the music, of the publishers of the music. But we think that the objectives of the digital agenda address also their interests. Uh, let me uh, once again uh, say what the uh, um, objectives of the digital agenda are. It's, it's about simplification and it's about efficiency. And we think that uh, if licensing becomes more simple and more efficient, uh, it will reduce transaction costs 
and uh, ultimately leave more money also to the right holders, uh, more remuneration, which can then be di distributed to authors and publishers. And uh, so far, my, my overview on uh, digital content in the single market and on how we want to, uh, to address it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I would like to maybe raise again the questions which was brought up earlier. How do you see, from the audiovisual content perspective, the present uh, 27 different regulations? Is there any rationale, any idea of establishing a common European licensing territory? Would that be an idea? Or is that too much to swallow for the big markets who are used to act according to the present distribution owners? Well, we think um, there's definitely a case for, for making licensing more simple and more efficient. And the question is, how do we achieve that? And um, uh, creating a new uh, licensing system on top of the national licensing systems that we already have is not necessarily uh, the best solution. It's, it's maybe one option, uh, but we should also look at other options. And uh, I think we can, lots, uh, we can do a lot um, when we improve the current situation, when we uh, remove um, discrimination or uh, exclu um, exclusive uh, clauses in the, in the current systems that, that we, uh, in the current national systems that we already have. I don't think that we have to reinvent the wheel I think we can uh, improve the existing systems to achieve a digital single market. Uh, Estonian government has, within its uh, European Union policy priorities, also brought out the, uh, one of the priority areas in terms of the licensing and intellectual uh, property enhancement systems, uh, multi-licensing, which uh, we would like to support very much. How do you see the reaction on other member states towards the multi-licensing uh, of uh, different creative content? Do you mean uh, multi-territorial licensing? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think um, um, the, the, uh, the reactions are in principle positive. Of course, you will have uh, different interest groups in the, in, in the member states uh, who will be more or less in, in favor of that. Uh, and who will be more or less vocal in specific member states. But uh, in, in, in principle, I think um, when, when we talk to representatives of member states, nobody is really opposed to multi-territorial licensing. The question is more, um, would that be a compulsory system or would it be an optional system? On the green paper, I understood that uh, the consultations were over, or oh, not the consultations, but the feedback was expected to be delivered to you by 18th of November, yes. and uh, you received over 100 different submissions. What do you see as a next part of the step, and what will be the progress of the green paper? When will be the anticipated kind of uh, uh, new version or amended version be available publicly? Do you have any any ideas in? in the roadmap? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. We, we first have to analyze the contributions we received and uh, we have started that uh, now. Um, and then we will have to, to see what conclusions to draw from that. We have, uh, from the technology perspective, of course, people are, uh, in most cases, especially in the environment like IT college, and in the debates over our uh, information society future, we don't understand at all the relics of kind of terri territory. The students in age of 20, 20 plus, they don't understand anything about territories, roamings, uh, and, uh, and they, they often ask from professors, where do those relictic ideas come from? Why are they still here? And students are most often trying even to, they are willing to give out your national identity if somebody would come out with a European identity, saying that I have an opportunity to obtain an 
an identity which allows me to use fairly all the services and goods which I have purchased all over the European territory, wherever I happen to be. The same iTunes and iPhone issues are very similar also to Erasmus students, which go to another country with the subscriptions they have purchased, and it turns out that no, you can't no longer use it. The German students in Estonia are in, in pain, the Finnish students in Portugal are in pain, and it just creates extra mess and extra resistance and attempts to find a new hacks to work around the existing mm. systems. So it's to a certain degree, at least from the young generation of information society inhabitants, it's totally un un understandable and non-tolerable situation and they just can't understand how can it take so much time. So this is perhaps our kind of student feedback. But I have an actual attorney, attorney also who is practicing bringing a dimension. Uh, yes, thank you. I would like to continue from this uh, point because actually I was writing my master thesis in Amsterdam Information Law Institute and my supervisor was uh, Professor Bert Hugenholz, probably you know him. And uh, he has been telling that basically we cannot contract around about territoriality principle. We can discuss it and discuss it and discuss it uh, in Europe and one day we just need to agree and abandon it, this territoriality in a copyright sense because it it has to be a decision that we cannot go on like that, but maybe it requires like about 25 more years to come that uh, these uh, young people who understand it really, that why we need it, like we don't need it at all anymore. Because yeah, this, for example, this framework <coughs> instrument on collective management, I wrote my thesis a couple of years ago and then before that was this online music recommendation. It, it has been starting from the year 2004 already and actually there hasn't been any clear improvement, like, like really, what has been changed? I would like to ask, like, what has changed? I know that there has been some initiatives from the uh, collective management organizations themselves, but uh, mostly they have been crushed by the DG competition, that uh, it's already against the competition law principles, what they are trying to do, kind of officiate some things. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think um, you, you are right to mention that um, um, these discussions are not new. These discussions have, have started earlier than, than uh, uh, 2004. But I think um, you can observe uh, developments in the markets. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning um, an increase of uh, demand for, for content, for digital content. Um, when, we, when we see uh, uh, several um, national markets, we, we've seen an increase of legitimate offers. We have uh, now in Germany about uh, 40 different uh, music offers. Uh, in, in France it's, uh, it's, it's a bit more than, than that. So I think um, there are uh, positive developments, but I don't say that this is the ideal situation. Uh, because uh, some of the, of the territories in the uh, European Union are not necessarily benefiting from them. And, and that's, the, um, that's, the, that's the problem. And I agree with you that, uh, of course, you, you, you cannot uh, explain to, to, to anybody that uh, you, you can buy a CD in, in one country and uh, ship it to the, to the other country, but you can't do that with uh, digital content, although it should be much easier. This is a, a paradox which you, you cannot reasonably explain. I completely agree. Um, the question is how do we address this problem uh, in a most pragmatic way to, to find um, uh, solutions most, uh, uh, most quickly. And, uh, well, uh, discussions like uh, with Bernd Hugenholz about uh, removing territoriality are, are quite nice, but, but this is certainly not the, uh, this is not the short-term approach to, to, to this, I would say. I think the, the, the best approach would be uh, a pragmatic approach which, which looks at the current system, which looks at the, um, at the needs that we have within this, this current system and how we can uh, Im Im improve it, how we can make the uh, different national systems better work together. I'm so happy that in addition to two subjects which everybody in human society is experts, they used to be an 
health, medicine, and second was education, where everybody are experts. We have now an additional area, which is intellectual property and copyright issues. It always gets extremely emotional on whatever forum it will be highlighted. And I'm glad to say that our this year's Information Society Forum in Estonia also was dedicated to digital content and regulations around that. And it, obviously, it, it went emotional. It never stops. People continue having arguments. And that's very interesting and very nice to have that in addition to health and education, we have people expert also always in uh, now in copyright issues. Uh, thank you once again, and uh, I would like to give a floor to our, uh, our another colleague from the DG InfoSoc, uh, Gerard. Gerard Galer, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I will uh, present you two topics. So I have two PowerPoint presentations. The first one, <coughs> which is my specialty, is uh, the pan European framework for electronic identification, authentication, and signature. And after, I will talk about the cybersecurity. So this pan-European framework actually is something which we are working on and that should become a reality in the coming months. So regarding EID and e-signature, where do we stand today in EU? Not in Estonia, because in Estonia you are the vanguard. So actually my presentation will sound like something historical for Estonia, while for most other European countries, it's still the future, so forgive me for that. So uh, about 12 years ago, the European Union adopted a directive on electronic signature that sets the legal framework for e-signature by introducing two very important things. First thing is the non-discrimination of electronic signature. Before the directive, I could have sent a mail to you with any kind of commitment, I will give you 10,000 uh, euros. Yeah, they were already existing by then. I will give you 10,000 euros. Uh, and then just say, no, I don't care. I send you an email. It has absolutely no legal value. So that's something which is not possible anymore since the directive is there. The other important things that the directive is doing is the equivalence between an electronic signature and a handwritten signature. So it's just a bridge, actually. It does not define what is a signature, but it defines in which condition an electronic signature is equivalent to a handwritten signature. And then you're back in classic law, which has been devised for centuries. We also have a, 
wide set of standards that were prepared by SEN and ETSI, the two European standardization organization, and they relate to all facets of electronic signature. Actually, they were developed at the request of the Commission following the adoption of the directive. So basically, they address all bits and pieces of the directive. But only few of them are mentioned directly in the directive. So only few of these standards have actually a legal value. Member states and the industry made a lot of investment to have e-signature system working. But the result, unfortunately, is that interoperability of e-signature between countries is almost non-existing and the take-up within countries of e-signature is also suboptimal, except in some countries where it's forced by law or in Estonia where uh, you love so much IT. So in 2008, the Commission decided to do something, but in the context of the service directive, the first thing that we did was to create an obligation for member states to establish a trusted list of qualified certificate provider. And for those who don't know, a certificate is uh, like an ID card where you can see a sample of my signature. So if I send you a contract and a copy of my ID card, you will check that the signature which is on my ID card is the same as the one which is on the contract. And then you will say, okay, it's really, uh, I'm really the person who signed the contract. The problem if you receive the certificate in Greek from a private Greek company, first you don't read Greek, you even do not re understand the alphabet, and you never heard about the company. So how should you trust this document? You will not trust it. So the idea was to establish a European list of all the certificate providers but providing qualified certificates, or high-grade certificates. There are about 120 of these are providers in Europe. Another thing also in the service directive was to um, <clears throat> say that point of single contact, so point of single contacts are one-stop shops of the national administration that will receive any request to prov from a service provider from a third country to provide a service in the target country when the, the given service is subject to administrative um, formalities. The service directive said that this must be done electronically. Um, so the a small piece of legislation said that this point of single contact must handle uh, some standards defined by Etsy, which is some kind of big bang because actually it provides a very strong recognition to these standards and you may expect that these standards will now spread everywhere in the administration and in the private sector. So I would think that the impact of this small law, which is dedicated to service, actually will have a, a, a wider effect. Fifth uh, point is that there is no legislation at European level on EID. Very few countries have it in Europe. I think Estonia is one of the countries. Austria is the other one. For the rest, EID is not part of the national legislation, and even less at EU level. So the, the situation is not perfect, far from being perfect, but uh, the landscape is changing, so there are new features to be taken into account and new need to address. There are new drivers for e-signature and relate signature to electronic signature, like registered email. Public e-procurement is becoming a reality. I mean, it's really a political... Uh, a wish of all member states to do procurement by electronic means, which saves a lot of money. And if you know that public procurement is 19% of European GDP, I mean, it's not a small part of European economy. The service directive uh, entered into force end of 2009, and it requires electronic signature, as I just explained. Since service are 70% of the EU GDP, I mean, we are not talking about something uh, marginal. Businesses are more and more willing to automate their processes, like sending electronic invoice, 
uh, not having paper, archives, but electronic archives, and to do this kind of things, electronic signature is bringing very convenient solutions. Finally, uh, environment protection is now uh, on everybody's lips, so saving paper is important, and again, e-signature is a solution. Last thing is that EID cards are becoming widespread in Europe. Estonia, again, is a pioneer with almost 100% coverage of the population. It's the same in some other countries like Portugal or Belgium. Germany has started a rollout. So very, let's say, soon most EU member states will have an infrastructure of EID cards, which in most cases are enabled with electronic signature. So it will be something available for service providers for government to offer new service or to request for stronger authentication of user and stronger commitment. So we have a new landscape. All the hypotheses that were made 12 years ago do not stand. No, we have new drivers. Fine, so what do we want? Since we have a new landscape, it's also the right time to ask us what do we really want? Well, probably what we want is to boost trust online a way to boost trust online is to have secure and seamless electronic transaction between administration, between businesses, between citizens, and all possible combinations. Transaction must offer legal certainty. Indeed, what's the point to sign electronically a document if I'm not sure that the signature will be recognized? When I sign it with a pen, which costs less than one euro, I have almost a full legal certainty that this signature will be recognized. I should hurry up, so I will. Uh, signature should be easy to use by non-specialists. They should be low cost to be operated. And they should work across EU borders, but not only EU borders, across the world, since we live in a global world. So how to address this? Well, in the digital agenda, there were two actions calling for the revision of the e-signature directive and for the establishment of the legislation on EID mutual recognition. These were, these were mentioned in the digital agenda and reiterated several times later. So we are working and now we have to provide a draft for second quarter 2012, well, a draft proposal for legislation that will then start a legislative process. E-signature and EID are considered by the Union, including the member states, as a top priority to support EU growth. So, um, before drafting a legislation, we like to ask the stakeholders what they think about the situation, the existing situation, and their ideas for potential solutions. So that's what we did beginning of this year. The problem here is that they gave us contrasted view on the cause of the low take-up of signature. So there is not one cause, so one problem to solve, but several problems to solve. For instance, we don't have so many services requiring e-signature. We don't have user-friendly solutions. And cross-border interoperability is an issue. Worse, they gave us all kinds of solutions to solve the problems, so uh, no silver bullet solutions. If you want to know more, please go on our website where the contribution and the summary are posted. And so from this consultation and other contact we have with all kinds of stakeholders, member states and the industry, we conclude that we need something powerful to address secure transactions in the internet addressing at the same time EID and e-authentication for natural persons, for legal persons, that we should also address website authentication, because the website is the window of a shop on the internet. So, but how to be sure that this website really belongs to the company and how to be sure that the company really exists, a company or a public administration or an NGO also something that needs to be handled and which does not work really well today. It's the role in authorization. Who will tell you that I'm authorized to sign on behalf of a company or that I'm authorized to sign on behalf of my kids or that I'm registered on a social security system? So that should be accessible online. 
Second trust enabler is e-signature, which is something old already, but that where interoperability must be solved and ease of use. Thirdly, we need to complete the picture by providing ancillary trusted service working at European level, like electronic seals, i.e. the signature of a legal person, like a rubber stamp, but electronically made, timestamp, electronic signature archiving, certified e-delivery, and e-documents, which are already all in e Estonian law, so nothing new for you. I will go very quickly on that. I mean, all these trust enablers share common principle, so we will try to make that in a very coherent way and elegant way in the new legislation to have something easy to understand by all. So the next step is to complete consultation of stakeholders, and then to produce an impact assessment, which is a public document. Why do we do a legislation? What are its impact? What are the drawbacks? What are options and to put forward a legislative proposal by mid-2012 that will then enter the legislative process, after which we will um, produce implementing act, so basically reference to standards. These legislative works goes in parallel with a work of revising all the electronic signature standards that SEN and Etsy are currently doing at our request. So that closes chapters on e-signature. Any ID? Maybe nice to have questions on that. Or do you want me to go on with cybersecurity? Just one question, and that is related to the topic of uh, present collaboration between countries. There are some uh, bilateral agreements in between countries which recognize the digital signatures and EID of each other. Uh, and we are, we are seeking and recognizing more this type of bilateral recognitions. Is that something which you encourage or is that something which you discourage in light of the broader pan-European legislative uh, initiative? Uh, well, actually, electronic signature must be recognized. That's in the directive. So there you have no choice. Uh, we have a framework at European level. So fine. It should work technically, but legally it's working. EID, uh, well, if you have a bilateral agreement today, it would be very easy to transpose it at European level. So actually the work that you will do today actually is already building the block of the, the full legislation. So it's not conflicting, on the contrary. Thank you. You're welcome. You want to continue with the uh, topic of cybersecurity right away?
so cyber security um, so cyber security if actually one of the pillar of the digital agenda then it's explored in several sub actions many on DG information society many on DG home affairs and some on other DGs I will not detail all of them. The, the streams are cyber security preparedness, second stream cyber crime, third stream safety and privacy of online content and services. So I will develop the one which is uh, on the left side, cyber security preparedness. So actually it includes an important thing is the modernization of the European Network and Information Security Agency. So it's an agency that was uh, created uh, no, I think about eight years ago that through a regulation, so a legal text, this agency has a mandate which expires and w the agency had a kind of limited mandate just to provide advice, let's say. So the idea is to have an agency which will have um, um, a reinforced um, role and also a modernized uh, mandate to be more active on problems of today and also to extend this lifespan by five years. So the, uh, yeah, the new regulation actually will bring more flexibility to the agency that had a mandate which was a bit rigid on addressing cybersecurity issues and you will have some examples later in my speech uh, to allow a better alignment with EU regulatory process to work somehow or to interface with fight against cybercrime and to have a better organization in general. Our cybersecurity policy is detailed actually in a communication which was adopted in March of this year. Actually, our cybersecurity policy is something old that we started um, I think beginning of the 2000s with the first communication that was followed by another one in 2006, followed by another one in 2009. And a renewed one in 2011 and we are working on another one so it's a it's a topic which is very important and which is evolving and on which we are doing more and more and more so the current status is the um, communication that we adopted in March of 2001 which reports on the achievement of the previous one so interesting to note what was in the previous one because it's the stream of action that we will do for cybersecurity, we did, we are doing and we will continue to do, is to improve preparedness and prevention, so to be ready for all kind of uh, problems on networks, not only terrorism but natural disaster, just accident breakdowns, uh, to be able to detect problem and to respond quickly by mitigating the problems and recovering from them afterwards to boost international cooperation obviously when we talk about the internet we are not limited to the 27 member states and uh, also a kind of important detail to protect what we call critical information infrastructure but what is a critical information infrastructure it needs to be defined so you need criteria it's not all the PCs in Europe. If not, you would have hundreds of millions of PCs that are, need to be protected. It's not only the big, big server. If not, you would not protect sufficiently well. So you need to find the right granularity and then to impose legislation on it to impose uh, some kind of uh, monitoring by member states. Some concrete example of what has been achieved We've asked member states to establish national or governmental CERT. CERT is a computer emergency response team. So 20 member states now have them. It's a very steep progression in the last years. 
The European Union are establishing currently a cert for themselves, so for the Commission, Parliament, Council, etc. Twelve member states have carried out cyber exercises at national level. To be ready for attacks, you need to do cyber exercises, of course. We organized in 2010 an exercise at European level, so um, many all the EU member states participate, but also uh, Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland. We even organized an exercise, or we took part to an exercise organized by the United States. And uh, we are defining European principles and guidelines for internet resilience and stability, together with member states, and actually, we all are also working to promote them at international level. More needs to be done. We need a search in all countries. We need more exercise. We need coordinated effort at European level. Member states and the European Union should talk with the same voice. So we, yeah, it's, I've been asked to speed up, so all this is always building, again, the same idea, let's say, to, to be prepared to react, to have the facility to react, to cooperate internationally. And this last slide is on what will come next, so a communication which is foreseen for next year to refresh our strategy. So the objective will be, again, to enhance and align member states' prevention, detection, mitigation, and response capabilities, to stimulate the private sector to improve security in its products and services, since the private sector is kind of owning 90% of the communication infrastructure and uh, producing all the software products. Security should be embedded from the beginning to create a resilient uh, information society, to raise end user awareness, and users should be aware of the security and risk on the internet. They should know how to act, how to react, like the street can be dangerous, but if you know how to cross the street, the street is not uh, dangerous anymore, so it's not uh, to terrorize people, but just to make them aware of the reality. We should make the best use we can on research and innovation related to IT security and uh, put in place a robust industrial policy. We are very uh, good industrial players in Europe, worldwide level, so it, we should build on that and further develop our industrial policy for ICT security. Continue international discussions on cyber security and also ensure a strong EU response to cybercrime when something is happening. So, more information is available on our website. And Thank you so I much. You managed to catch up. Thank you. And uh, we, of course, as also many other pre re presentations, were reflecting the ever-going challenge we have in Europe uh, around the 27 member states and about the fragmentation which you in the Commission attempt to sort of balance into a coherent policies. We see the same also in the, in the cyber security issues where a number of the members of European Union are not even ratified or signed the Budapest Convention or, or the so-called Convention on Cybercrime where a number of the European Union members are part of the NATO, which is dealing with uh, a special emphasis on the cybersecurity and where some countries are even not having a uh, very strong awareness around the cybersecurity issues yet. So there is a plenty of challenges which remain to you. Uh, on the slide before the last uh, about uh, the, the European uh, internet security strategy, how challenging you see that to become because it will cover the presently quite fragmented topics and in order to come out with, uh, with a joint strategy, it requires uh, quite a strong collaboration also with the NATO and with uh, 
and partners which want clearly to remain very neutral in terms of the um, defence policies. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a long process, probably. We seriously started to talk about a cyber security policy in the year 2000 without having something really clear in the treaty allowing us to act. So it's more the goodwill of member states that we try to, to stimulate. And we progress because they realize that something happened. Then in 2007, actually, Estonia was a victim of a cyber attack, which probably woke up everybody in Europe, saying that it's real. It's not only you know, a, um, a people predicting the end of the world. No, it can happen. And actually, Estonia was very uh, proactively, let's say, talking about its experience, so which was very interesting. Instead of hiding things, as you could have done, not telling to anybody what really happened, you were very open to explain to everybody what happened, what you did, and you were inviting people, you were traveling. And I think this transparency made a lot to show that problems can happen, but you can also solve them. And actually something which happened what, during this uh, attack is that by chance you had, I think, all the people of the CERTs gathered for, by chance in Tallinn. So we could cooperate very easily and showing that cooperation actually was the key to the issue. So it was actually, we could say, we were fortunate that you had this problem because it, I think it launched a stream of cooperation that is now continuing. We have established a forum, the EFMS, European Forum for Member States, where member states can talk together in a kind of friendly manner uh, with a kind of um, well, enough privacy so security people can talk together. It's working. We have established a partnership with the industry since, uh, well, as I said, uh, the industry has a lot of the, the ICT infrastructure in its end. So, I would say, uh, the, the momentum is there, I think. So we, we can just build on that and uh, so I would be ready to bet that the next version of the strategy will be easily accepted and that we'll go one step further than the previous one. But that there will be another one in five years. Thank you. We are so happy that Estonia was able to contribute with its own accident also to a broader European awareness. And honestly, we are also very happy that it happened to us because our own network is more secure than ever thanks to that particular event which also raised our awareness. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our dear viewers, this was our uh, seminar today at the Estonian IT College. Uh, it was part of the going local tour of the DG Information Society of European Commission and I am once again very glad and happy to thank all the presenters. From, uh, in order to, to remain and to leave the house uh, with uh, sweet memories, we have prepared also uh, an, uh, some handmade chocolate, which is, uh, which is not inter... Well, it, it's not related in exactly with our profile of Estonian IT College, but as we attempt to also to be an, an interdisciplinary institution in higher education, I hope that will also satisfy your needs. Thank you once again. Suur tänu kõigile vaatajatele ja taaskord neid materjale, mida te täna nägite, on hea meel, kui te jagate ning kasutate oma õppe- ja koolitöös kõikikina nägemist.